reading from the book of the prophet Hosea. Thus says the Lord, I will lead her into the desert and speak to her heart. She shall respond there as in the days of her youth when she came up from the land of Egypt. I will espouse you to me forever. I will espouse you in right and in justice, in love and in mercy. I will espouse you in fidelity, and you shall know the Lord. Verbum Domini. Listen to me, daughter, see and bend your ear. Hear, O daughter, and see. Turn your ear. Forget your people and your father's house. So shall the king desire your beauty, for he is your Lord, and you must worship him. All glorious is the king's daughter as she enters. Her raiment is threaded upon with spun gold. In embroidered apparel, she is born to the king. Behind her, the virgins of her train are brought to you. They are born in with gladness and joy. They enter the palace of the king. The place of your fathers, your sons shall have. You shall make them princes through all the land. Evangelii secundum Mateum. Gloria Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil with them. But the wise brought flask of oil with their lamps. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight there was a cry, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, no, for there may not be enough for us and you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. While they went off to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him. Then the door was locked. Afterwards, the other virgins came and said, 
Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he said in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay awake, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Verbum Domini. Jesus is teaching us today like these dedicated virgins waiting on the bridegroom we are to main we are to be alert and attentive waiting upon the Lord and his coming Today we celebrate the memorial of Saint Cecilia who the exact time of her life and the, the d details of her life are not known for certain but she has been honored in the early church. She's part of uh, the Roman canon mentioned with the other virgin martyrs, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia. She's mentioned there with them. Very much honored in the early church. <clears throat> and what is known is that she dedicated her virginity to Christ, but her father, a non-believer, uh, betrothed her to Valerian, a young pagan in Rome, they were forced to marry, but during the ceremony, uh, she sung to the Lord in her heart. She gave this great hymn of praise and worship to the Lord, and she, for this reason, is the patroness of music. She winds up converting her husband, and they never came together in a conjugal way. The legend is under threat from her angel. He, stood his distance, but uh, he converted, his brother converted, he later was martyred in, in his piety towards uh, and burying Christians that had been killed or martyred. And then she was later condemned to death for refusing to worship the pagan gods. And a soldier in her execution bungled the job and hacked at her neck and did not finish it and she lay dying for three days. And this is immortalized in a beautiful statue if you go to Rome today to the Church of St. Cecilia. I think it's from the 1600s of Baroque. A beautiful statue of her laying with the scar on her neck, you know, a marble <coughs> statue. Very compelling you know, to see her witness. She was inspired to make, you know, with. There's no precedent in the Old Testament for making these vows of virginity. Marriage is rightly exalted. As Christians, we exalt marriage. It's a sacrament of the church. It's a path to holiness. But she was inspired to make a vow to belong, to consecrate herself to the Lord, both in body and soul, that she belonged to him totally. This is inspired by what our Blessed Mother did that's revealed in the Annunciation scene. You know, at the message of the angel telling her she will conceive, she says, how can this be since I have no relations with a man? You know, we're told for that in the passage, she's betrothed to a man named Joseph. In the Jewish culture, that is married, yet they have not come together. So naturally you'd say, well, when we come together, we'll have children. She intends, though, in her question, to remain a virgin. How can this be? Since I'm not going to have normal relations with a man, the, whole, the angel goes on, Gabriel goes on to explain to her that it's through the Holy Spirit that she will conceive. So she has this vow that she has made. Mary has been inspired by her heart. So we see this precedent at the very beginning of the New Testament that in the incarnation, in the coming of Christ, we have this new vocation Jesus speaks of as a, a celibacy for the kingdom of heaven, you know, that has a, as its goal to serve the kingdom of heaven that by the presence of Christ in our lives, some are called to this life of virginity. So in Mary we see, she's the model, we see this self-giving in virginity and the Holy Spirit 
brings her fruitfulness. She becomes the mother of Jesus. And Cecilia and these virgin martyrs and those uh, since them, those since that time, those who've been inspired to make a vow of celibacy, virginity for the sake of the kingdom, there's also a fruitfulness by the gift of the Holy Spirit. It takes this great gift of oneself we take these powers of life and love that we have within us, give them to the Lord, it bears fruit in his kingdom through the working of the Holy Spirit. We have to remember that marriage is an earthly reality. It's a sacrament. It's a sign of the, the wedding feast of the Lamb where Jesus, the bridegroom, gives himself to the church, has this union with the church. The vow of celibacy or virginity, or the, or the, I mean marriage, is an image of this. So it points to that reality, that eternal <clears throat> heavenly reality that we're all called to, and that sacrament passes away to the reality of this heavenly life. Virginity, for the sake of the kingdom, renounces the great good of marriage to belong to the Lamb, to follow the Lamb wherever he goes, as the book of Revelation speaks of, to belong to him on this side of eternity. It's a prophetic witness of eternal life, of heavenly life. To be intent on the things of the Lord, to seek to please him totally, as the parable says today, to go out to meet the bridegroom who is coming, to wait upon the Lord, to be attentive, to his directions in a special way, in a, a way that is a gift to a person that's called to this. It's rooted in baptism. All the baptized are called to belong to the Lord and live this heavenly life. And through a gift of celibacy, they begin that life in an extraordinary way here by a gift to the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is the center of all Christian life in marriage, you know, his wedding with the, his church, his mystical body is manifested. The celibacy, you know, that wedding, the individual, you know, in the church is manifested. He always takes precedence over all other bonds, familiar or so, familial or social. So virginity for the sake of the kingdom is an unfolding of baptismal grace. It's a sign of the supremacy of the bond of Christ above all other bonds. It expresses a, an ardent expectation of his return, that he is the fullness, he is everything. We're waiting for that consummation of the kingdom, that this world is passing, the fullness is yet to come. Uh, virginity you know, speaks of that, it, it preaches that, it proclaims that by the virgin's life dedicated virginity, and it's a sign that recalls that marriage is a reality of this present age which is passing away. But the Lord is inspiring both vocations. You know, we see, you know, in Genesis, this call to marriage, the original couple is made, they're called to be, uh, the two are called to become one, it's instituted by God. We know due to sin, there's a fallen aspect to it. You know, Jesus says that Moses permitted divorce due to the hardness of your hearts. Jesus comes to heal that sign, to heal that union by his grace, to say it's indissoluble. He gives us grace to live that vocation to its fullness, that it can be this beautiful sign of the kingdom. And he also inspires this call to virginity, this gift that's rooted in baptism that some are called to, to belong to him, in this special way. Both inform the other. You know, marriage, you know, as I, I've often inspired by married couples, the virtues they lead in their life. It's very concrete, it's very real. You know, you have demands of family life every day that you have to grow in these virtues if you're gonna live that, that vocation well. And that, that makes, that teaches the celibates, you know, in their vocations, not to get, not to over-spiritualize, that there is no holiness that passes by natural virtue, that pass, passes by those 
realities. No, we're all called to grow in virtue, period. And I think uh, married life witnesses that. I can, and from my experience, witnesses that in a supreme way. And hopefully, uh, virginity for the sake of the kingdom witnesses of the life of the Beatitudes, of a life of grace, of a life of being intent on the Lord in prayer and dedication and service of the kingdom witnesses to married people. It's a beautiful interplay that takes, takes place. May we be faithful to whatever vocation we've been given in this life to the intercession and witnesses of the, of the saints, especially St. Cecilia today who gave everything, who gave her very life uh, to witness to Christ.